thank you all so much for um, coming to this campaign's breakfast today. Uh, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm Bella. I'm the local action officer for sustainable food places at Sustain. Um, I've started a couple of months ago now, so hopefully I've, I've crossed paths with some of you, but I'm looking forward to meeting the rest of you when I get the chance to. Um, so we're actually in a meeting format today, not a webinar, so that it can be a bit more interactive, but uh, I do need to ask you to make sure your microphones are muted uh, so that we can hear all the speakers clearly. And we will be re recording this to share online. So bear that in mind if uh, you'd rather not have your video recorded. If you're happy to, uh, please do have your cameras on for the interactive parts of the session because it's always nice to see faces. And please do post any questions for the speakers in the chat as we go along. So I'll just kick us off with a couple of updates first. Um, so on the Sugar Smart campaign, we're looking to do some work later in the year on energy drinks, specifically the government's ban on the sale of energy drinks to under 16s, which has as yet not been implemented. So look out for a blog in the coming weeks that will set out some of the details and our position and um, be prepared in a few months time for some more active campaigning on the matter. You might have seen as well that we've been doing some work on Healthy Start. The poor digitization of Healthy Start scheme is leaving many people at risk of losing their payments. Following an open letter to the Secretary of State, Sajid Javid, supported by 155 signatories and led by Sustain and the Food Foundation, we're in contact with the Department for Health and Social Care and the Healthy Start team, who have now corrected some technical glitches in the digital application system. Uh, we've also launched an interactive tool that lets you easily see the shortfall per local authority area. Um, so if you work with any beneficiaries of the scheme and have encountered issues, please do let us know or join the Healthy Start Rise Up list. So it's a pleasure to be hosting this campaign's breakfast on ultra processed foods or UPFs for the Soil Association and have brilliant speakers, Rob Percival, um, Vicky Sibson, the director of First Steps Nutrition Trust and councillor Jackie Floyd, chair of Blackburn with Darwin Food Resilience Alliance here too. It feels like a very timely conversation to be having. UPFs are considered one of the leading drivers of the combined crises of nature loss, global heating, malnutrition and obesity. To quote from the Soil Association, UPFs are often high in fat, salt and added sugar and depleted dietary fibre. They tend to be aggressively marketed and such foods make up the bulk of the UK diet, comprising more than 50% of the average shopping basket. The Soil Association have been doing brilliant work on UPFs for several year na years now, and I'd highly recommend you have a look at the reports that they've published on that. I'll share the links in a moment. But they're not just here today to inform us about UPFs, they also want to hear from you to find out how they can support SFP members to address the prevalence of UPFs in our diets and start to see a shift at the national, regional and local scales. So we've got a lot to squeeze into this session. Um, you'll see on the agenda, first we'll hear from our speakers with a couple of opportunities for questions, and then we hope you'll stay for some breakout rooms where you'll have a chance to share thoughts and chat directly to the Soil Association about how they can help you address UPFs in your communities. Finally, we'll have a feedback session to reflect on our conversations all together. So uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Rob Percival. He's head of food policy at the Soil Association, which is a charity, as I'm sure you all know, who campaign for a better food system by working with citizens, farmers, policymakers, and businesses. So uh, thanks, Rob, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, thank, thanks for being here. Um, uh, really pleased to be sharing a few thoughts with you and having the opportunity to, to discuss this issue. Um, the Soil Association has been campaigning on ultra processed foods for the past two years, but our, our focus has primarily been on national policy. And we're now really keen to, to explore um, what we can do at a, a local and regional level and, and, and pick your brains about all that. Um, so by, by way of an introduction, I, I hope most of you will have seen Chris Van Turken's um, do documentary um, wherein he, he spent a month eating a highly ultra-processed diet, 80% was ultra-processed, and then monitored the, the health outcomes associated um, with that diet. So a sort of mini scientific experiment which um, brings to life the, a, a really big and growing body of evidence um, associating ultra-processed foods, ultra-processed diets with ill health. Um, Chris ate a wide variety of, of foods, uh, the various of them uh, assembled here. Um, lots of them we, we commonly associate as being junk foods, but lots of them actually we, we don't. Um, the, the ultra processed category is, is pretty broad um, uh, and, and the results were really striking. He, he, he noted um, 
alterations to his his mood, his appetite, the way he was sleeping and thinking. He put on weight and um, uh, brain scans revealed uh, rewiring of his neural networks associated with uh, craving and, and, and appetite. And this was all in the space of a month. Um, in the UK, we, as, as Bella said, we consume on average more than 50% of our, our calories in, in ultra processed foods, um, sometimes far higher. And, and for children who are growing and developing, their brains are developing, this is of, of real concern. Uh, there's a, a really strong body of evidence now associating ultra processed diets with obesity, type 2 diabetes, premature mort mortality, um, and emotional and psychological ill health. Um, so what do we what do we mean by ultra processed foods? There's a, a lot on this slide, so you might not be able to see it all. But the um, the, the term derives from uh, the Nova categorization system, which was developed by Brazilian researchers in in 2009. They um, they suggested that instead of looking at the nutrient composition of a food product, we should look at how highly processed it was. And they came up with four categories. Um, category one um, is minimally processed, um, fresh and natural foods, which are exactly what you'd assume they are, the plants and, and bits of animal that we that we consume that haven't been highly processed. Category two is culinary ingredients, so um, salt and, and cooking oil, things that we use to, to, to cook the, these minimally processed foods to, to turn them into a dish. There's a really important distinction between Nova category three and four, so processed foods versus ultra processed foods. Processed foods can play a really healthy and helpful role in the diet. These might be uh, frozen veg, tinned fish, um, pickled things, various things that have been fermented. Um, there's lots of ways we can process food um, to, to preserve it, to, to extend its shelf life, uh, to make it more, um, to, to make it easier and more convenient to prepare. And, and there's no um, no evidence associating uh, this this category with with poor health. It's Nova category four ultra processed foods, which are the concern. And there's a very long definition of, of what these foods um, what these foods uh, look like, but, but they've more or less been modified so that there's no fresh or real food still evident within them through a series of industrial processes using um, various additives um, into, into readily consumable products that are highly marketed. Um, and it's a really diverse category, bringing in everything from um, kind of uh, sweets and confectionery to, to highly processed meat to ready, ready meals of various forms. Um, uh, the, the, some of the examples are listed there in the brown box, um, if you can see. Now, the average UK shopping basket, and this is the, the image on the right, the sort of donut looking thing, is more than 50% ultra processed. The, the left hand side of the, the donut points towards ultra processed foods. Um, a lot of it's uh, fizzy drinks and reconstituted meat, cakes, cookies, baked goods, um, snacks, breakfast cereals, all, all sorts fall in there. And some foods fall into both categories three or four. So if you're looking at bread or cheese, for example, or a breakfast cereal, it can either be processed in quite a healthy way or it can fall into that ultra processed category. And the, the evidence from, from across Europe shows that the UK consumes the, the most um, ultra processed diet uh, on the continent. Uh, and this is associated with the, the high levels of, of ill health that we, we have in this country. Um, so this is how we typically or historically have thought of um, foods as being either healthy or unhealthy, this, this traffic light system, which points towards fat, sugar, and salt, so HFSS foods, um, which are the focus of um, uh, most of the government's health policy. When we think of unhealthy foods, we often think of junk foods, burgers, um, uh, highly sugary foods, uh, and so on. And a lot of the health policy that we've seen come through has been focused on, on reformulation or addressing these specific nutrients. How do we remove sugar from the drinks that we're consuming? Um, and what we've been left with instead is a, a, a very many highly processed, um, artificially sweetened drinks, which might be better for our health, but, but definitely aren't the, the optimal thing for us to be consuming. And similarly, with highly processed foods, we can we can zap out the calories, we can remove the sugar, but you might still have a product at the end of that which isn't contributing to good health, um, which remains ultra processed. So there's um, there, there's no reason that that ultra processed foods and and this traditional nutrient profiling need to be think of as in competition, um, but we do need to look beyond. I think the HFSS framing, because there is a broader body of evidence which associates ultra processed foods um, with ill health. And like I said, they come in all shapes and sizes where we're talking about pot noodles and breakfast cereals, crisps and snacks, 
um, ready meals, pasta sauces, as well as uh, burgers and, and chicken nuggets um, and so on. Now, I don't, I, there's a lot of information on this slide and I'm not gonna talk through all of it. And it doesn't matter if, if you can't see it all in detail. Um, but I wanted to share that the, the health outcomes associated with ultra processed diets seem to be shaped along multiple overlapping pathways. So, so our health is shaped by different factors of the diet, different characteristics of the diet, um, which, which mutually reinforce one another to, to generate these, these poor out health outcomes. Um, on, on the one hand, there's um, a certain amount of displacement going on. Um, if we eat uh, lots of highly processed stuff and not enough fresh stuff, then we're probably not getting the fruit and veg that's, that's really good for us. So these foods are displacing healthy foods from the diet. Some of them are junk foods. They're the high in fat, sugar, and salt. Um, some of them are, are everyday foods that have been depleted. So if you look historically at the nutrient uh, value of a loaf of bread or, or a, a bowl of breakfast cereal, um, we've, we've zapped all the good stuff out of it through these high, highly industrialized processes that we apply to these foods. So actually many of the, the just everyday foods that we're eating aren't as healthy as they used to be and aren't delivering the goodness that they could. There seems to be something going on with the, the gut microbiome. The lack of fiber and dietary diversity associated with ultra-processed diets isn't good for the microbes that live in our gut, which contribute to our, to our health. Um, some of the additives that are common in, in ultra-processed foods, some of the sweeteners um, and, and emulsifiers that, that make up these foods are known to disrupt the gut, the gut microbiome in ways which might affect our health. And all this affects appetite and satiety, how satisfied we feel when we've eaten these foods. You could eat a, a, a loaf of highly processed white bread and still be hungry 10 minutes later. Um, and this, this lack of satiety, which is associated with, with ultra processed foods, uh, means that we, we overeat. Um, uh, the, the digestive system and hormone system seems to be affected by ultra processed diets in ways that mean our satiety signaling is, is disrupted. Uh, the body doesn't feel full. And all this um, shapes our health outcomes in, in really complicated ways. And underpinning this um, is a, an altered eating pattern. So many of these foods have been designed to be, to be eaten uh, on the move, um, absent-mindedly, such as in front of the television. Uh, they generate uh, novel moments for consumption throughout the day, generating a, a, an eating pattern predicated on sort of grazing, um, disrupted um, meal times, and, um, uh, and, and also a different sort of pace of, of, of consumption. So faster chewing and um, uh, more rapid um, ingestion. Uh, the, these foods have been um, often uh, carefully formulated to be what they call hyperpalatable, which means that we just gobble them, basically. Um, and all this um, contributes to the, in, in a really fundamental way, to, to, to the health outcomes that we associate with ultra processed diets. And, and really, it's, it's some of this that we want to unpick with you today. The way in which our diets are shaped by marketing and advertisements to, to include foods that we really don't need, the way that we're encouraged to eat foods outside of meal times, the way that products are marketed so as to encourage us to eat them at, at different times of the day when we don't necessarily need to, and the, the qualities of those products themselves, which um, might ostensibly seem to be healthy, might even be advertised as being natural or, or, or fresh or healthy, uh, but actually are, are contributing to this, this um, dietary pattern um, associated with ill health. And all Just of to this, let you know, Rob, you're coming to the end of your time. Sorry. Brilliant, thank you very much. Yes. And all of this is drilled into us um, from, from the very earliest age. Um, and, and Vicky from First Steps is going to help us understand how some of this um, emerges in, in infancy. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, it's, it's, the, um, it, it's this dietary pattern which we'd like to unpick with you today. Snacking, uh, altered eating behaviours and, and the drivers of that and what we might do to address that at a local level. So thank you very much for, for, for listening and, and looking forward to the conversation. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Rob. That was that was really helpful. Um, and it's interesting to hear that distinction between HFSS foods and UPFs and thinking about food that is actively contributing to better health rather than just sort of removing those things like sugar or, or calories from foods. Um, so now we've had that bit of an introduction to ultra processed foods, we're going to do a quick poll. Um, so I'll just ask Sophia to share that. The questions should appear on your screen. So just, just tick the appropriate boxes and then um, we'll share the results once you've all answered. This is just to get a bit of an idea about sort of levels of awareness about 
UPFs in, in your communities. I'm not saying anything, should I be? Um, I think... I'm not seeing anything either. Ah, yeah. Um, sorry, bear with us one moment. Uh, I, I launched the poll. I can see it in my screen. I'm not sure why uh, people can't see it on their screen. Ah, okay. So at the bottom of the bar, everyone, there's a button that says polls. It's between participants and chats. If you press on that button, does that bring it up for you? Got some thumbs up, some shaking heads. Says so poll is I closed. Have a poll button. So okay. Shall I relaunch the poll? I think there's a way to relaunch it. Yeah, um, Sophia, can you exit the poll and relaunch? Okay, how are we looking now? Have we got it? Okay, great. I've got thumbs up. Fantastic. Sorry about that, everyone. It was there for a second and then disappeared before I had a chance yeah. to tick it. Same for me as well. Same. Yeah. Got all excited. It was there and then push. <laughs> Can you see the poll button at the bottom of your screen? No, nope, there isn't one for me. Okay. Well, let's pop this to one side for the moment. Has, has that worked? Is that now popped up? Fantastic. We've got thumbs up again. I can see numbers coming in. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone, for, for, for hanging on in there. OK, so um, I'm not sure if, if, if everyone can see the results I'm seeing, but we've got everyone but one person so far says that this term is not well understood in their community. So um, that's 23 out of four saying no, it's not well understood, and one, one saying yes, it is well understood. I think everyone that's going to answer will answer that. So if we go on to the second question now, I think we can confidently say there that uh, it's felt that that isn't, isn't very well understood. Um, and are we able to move on to the second question, Sophia? Um. No one else, please touch the, the poll button because I'm trying to launch <laughs> it and I think there's more than one finger. Sorry about that. Okay, brilliant. Can everyone see the second question come up? Lovely, nodding heads. Excellent. So as they're coming in, it looks like TV, TV is winning as, um, <laughs> as the, the main place where people might have come across food um, with everything else, press, social media, SFP comms and campaigning organisations sort of coming in at a shared second, roughly. Nothing for baby and toddler groups, which is, will be something interesting to reflect on. Um, in the next talk that we have from Vicky. So I think you should be able to see the responses shared on the screen now. Um, and I think that's that's interesting to see that TV is coming in top. So you having said that maybe there's not very good understanding. So it looks like there's a great opportunity here for um, for work work to be done through SFP and in, in local, local communities. Um, so I haven't as yet seen any questions come through from, um, the, the chat specifically for Rob and we're a couple of minutes behind so what I might do we've got another Q&A session after our other two speakers um, so I will I think move us on to our next speaker and then we can do a Q&A for, for all three speakers at the same time afterwards um, so so thanks very much for that um, 
And uh, our next speaker is Vicky Sibson. Uh, she's the director of First Steps Nutrition Trust, an independent public health nutrition charity, filling practical and policy relevant information gaps and providing resources for health workers supporting eating well from preconception to five years of age in the UK. Vicky is a public health nutritionist by training and a mother of two young children, and she's passionate about protecting, promoting and supporting optimal feeding for all infants and young children. So Vicky, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you so much. Hi. Can everyone see my presentation? Perfect. OK. Thanks so much. Um, so I've been asked today to talk about ultra processed snacks for babies and young children. Um, so I'm going to launch straight in. I've got seven minutes and a lot to say. Um, just briefly, before I talk about um, these products, I wanted to get us all on the same page about where ultra processed snacks marketed for babies and young children might fit into their diets. So starting with babies, so by which we mean 0 to 12 months, um, optimal feeding practices are should be based on breastfeeding, immediate breastfeeding at birth, exclusive breastfeeding to around six months, and then continued breastfeeding. And when it comes to food, um, there should be introduction of solids at around six months and not really before. Um, and then the food, in terms of what foods, there should be avoidance of salt, sugar, and free sugars, and a focus on um, incremental diversification of the diet, flavor, and texture through six to 12 months. And the practical advice on NHS website basically talks about a move to three meals a day um, with ongoing milk feeds. And what you can notice therefore, is that it doesn't recommend snack, snacks, snacks are not needed. Um, even though um, I think this is really, really poorly understood amongst parents, families and the public. And um, when we talk about young children, we're talking about one to four year olds. And um, this is where snacks do come in. So the advice is that children of this age need varied diets comprised of three meals and two healthy snacks. So really the challenge is what parents and carers are led to believe by marketing healthy snacks are. So what snacks are being marketed for babies and young children and how? Here is just a small selection of the hundreds of thousands of products that are out there. Um, I'm focusing on ones uh, which have age, suggested ages on the packaging, because it's basically incontrovertible that they are being marketed for infants and young children. There's other products that might have um, cartoons and brand mascots and what have you, but we're focusing here on, on the ones with the ages. And you can see they go from six months plus seven, nine, ten, one year and there's this new range by one company three years plus so there's a suggestion that all these products are needed at different ages for different reasons and much of the marketing ploys center around misleading parents and carers into thinking they're making healthy choices for their children and um, that there's something beneficial about these types of foods and products um, so unpacking some of the marketing ploys health and nutrition claims are rife and there's been um, really good academic um, research into, into this, including on, on snack foods. Um, you've got um, products which are marketed um, as being positive for um, infants' motor development. So here's an example. It says encourages self-feeding. You've got a, an array of fruit-based snacks. Um, and you can see on here, it says packed with real fruit one of five a day but actually these are just full of free sugars which i just told you before should be avoided in infants and young children as totally misleading marketing and then you've got um uh products which and snacks which um try and sort of play up the vegetable component parents will be pretty most parents would probably realize that vegetables are positive for their children so we think by buying this their child's going to get some vegetables if you look at the um, ingredient list, this product has 11% tomatoes, even though tomato is the first named product in the name. And it also there's loads, if you look carefully, it's just one example and they're all the same. The statements on the back used to sell these unnecessary and unhealthy products. Um, there's just loads on there. <clears throat> I'm good, I'm made for playing and learning, made to keep little gums busy, just good stuff. 
So what, to what extent are these products which are being marketed really successfully to parents as being healthy, um, to what extent are they ultra processed? And this um, paper came out last year. It's a really, really good paper. Um, and the authors looked at um, over 3,000 foods marketed for infants and young children launched or relaunched across 27 European countries, including the UK. Um, and I asked the author to send me the UK data. And so there's 494 products that were launched or relaunched. This is March 2017 to March 2021. And 28.8% um, of the products were um, ultra processed. And then when you look at the categories that are most ultra processed, first one are baby biscuits and rusks, which are, to me, I, you know, quite likely to be given as a snack between a meal. We eat biscuits between meals as adults. So 73% of them are classified as, can be classified as ultra processed. And then you've got 53% of baby cereals, but then the next category is 47.8% baby snacks can be uh, classified as ultra processed. Um, and in most of these food categories, the ultra processed foods had higher energy, fat, saturated fat, sugars, and sodium content and lower fiber content compared to the minimally processed and processed ones. So you've got a problem with um, the nutrient composition as well as the fact that they're processed and what that means for um, the health implications that Rob outlined before. So I only had seven minutes, so I'm not gonna talk in um, more about um, health implications and why this matters. Um, I just wanna skip on to the potential actions to address, if we all assume that this is a bad thing, potential actions to address the consumption of UPFs, including um, snacks amongst babies and young children. And here are some of my ideas which would be great to get your reflections on. And they're picked from, they're not my ideas. I mean, they're, they're, they're ideas out there written in others' papers and um, being advocated in by other sort of ministries of health in other countries, but which are not really on the agenda here in the UK yet and probably ought to be. Um, so potentials are national dietary guidelines, which emphasize preference for, um, I can't really see mine. Let's see what it says anymore, I can't remember. Um, oh yeah, for fresh or minimally, minimally processed foods and avoidance of ultra processed foods and dietary guidelines that make specific recommendations for the early years because they, they're a group that do need specific recommendations. Better support for breastfeeding formula is, can be classified as an ultra processed food and I wasn't asked to talk about that today, um, but it's important to realise that. Um, ultra processed food taxes, perhaps, um, and subsidies for minimally processed foods, basically a means to make healthier fiscal options to make healthier food choices more affordable. Um, mandatory front of pack labeling and other improvements in marketing and labeling, um, including promotion and advertising restrictions for these types of products are marketed for infants and young children. Um, there's an international policy framework called the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes. Um, breast Milk Substitutes being a category that covers uh, foods and um, foods as well as drinks and milks that will, um, can be consumed from 0 to 36 months. So it's a broad category that would encompass snacks. So this would be um, a, a, an ideal policy framework to um, create a better legislative system to tackle these, these problems. And then that obviously any improvements in legislation need to be enforced. And then lastly, and I put it in brackets for reasons um, that Rob alluded to before, reformulation is an option. Um, so reformulation of these products, um, stronger regulations on the composition of foods and drinks marketed for infants and young children. And there's a nutrient profile model that's been developed in WHO Europe that would be useful here. The reasons I put it in brackets are um, reformulation may reduce sugar. Here's an example um, of some products and some comparisons. But it doesn't really get rid of the fact that they remain ultra processed. So um, positive in some ways, but not the answer to the ultra processed food problem. Um, so thanks, that's all I'm going to say now, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, when the time comes. Amazing. Thank you so much, Vicky. Um, it's so interesting to see how this might be impacting babies and young children, and just to see how misleading some of the marketing around this can be. So thanks. Thanks very much for a really interesting talk. Um, so now we're going to hear from the local perspective about work that's already being carried out in this area. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Councillor Jackie Floyd, who um, 
to be honest, is too interesting for me to do justice to her in a brief introduction. Um, storyteller, retired nurse, beekeeper, chair of the Blackburn with Darwin uh, Food Resilience Alliance and trustee of Blackburn Food Bank. Jackie's been interested in food and health since training as a midwife in the early 80s. So Jackie, be lovely to hear from you next. Thank you. Thank you. Do I just talk because my slides that I produced in the new year, um, I don't know how to put them up. So I thought of just talking to those stories and you can send the slides later yeah i'd be happy to share the slides if you need them or would you prefer just to uh, i think it, you know, it's the last one with the with the food waste so our, our story in blackburn with darwin and linking up with sustain is something that we tried um, four years ago through our director of public health and then this virus came along and sort of chucked all that work to one side um what we found at the beginning of thank you what news why you need an alliance and where it's going. We realised at the beginning there were a lot of new players into the food poverty arena. Suddenly everybody got excited about giving out food. Just go back to that first one. Sorry, because it's, do you see with Believing in Breastfeeding, we've got the UNICEF um, Gold Award. Uh, one of the UNICEF workers is around the corner from. Doesn't mean we have the best breastfeeding rates, but we're doing all the right things through the food bank and everything, not giving out formula milks unless you know the families had that that interview with the health visitor and we're promoting the right thing. And then we signed up to sustainable food places. Because um, the Northwest is such a deprived area, the government's forever using us as an experiment place. So we have healthier place, healthier futures going across the whole, um, if you think of that whole valley sort of from Preston all the way through to Burnley. So we have heaps of work being done at us, I call it. Next slide. So I'm, a, I'm also a, a midwife and a nurse by background who's done a lot of change work with the NHS. So I think that's a relevant skill that I've got that would, that hopefully folk understand where I'm coming from. So the vision was always to have a people's movement. Um, we've passed it through council. Have we done anything about it? Honestly, no. Change has to start with activists, but the COVID has pretty much exhausted everybody. So we need to give it another kick on to the next one. Thank you. So we're trying to wrap it. This is me trying to sell the Food Resilience Alliance, these slides as well to our local community. So we're quite clear within Blackburn with Darwin that we had to move away from the food poverty only conversation because COVID had shown up such a link with obesity and diabetes and we have high numbers of those throughout all parts of our community. We had to really up our game with the conversation about food. We're a trauma-informed town, so we already have lots of um, groups going on that understand that you have to wait, meet somebody where they're at um, and do it, walk alongside with them, not doing stuff at, at them or for them. And that's a really fine balance in behaviour change. So food is the key focus of prevention of ill health. So we're, we're fortunate by being a unitary authority, we can link with our four PCNs and start having that conversation and direct link with our local authority and trust. So it is, I accept that it's easier for us to get down to the people that need talking to because we're a nice unitary authority size. Uh, next slide. So... The, we sort of turned up, you know, the second, we had four pledges, but what really affected my thinking, I suppose, and what I start talking about with other people was during COVID, first one I read was how sugar corrupted the world. It fits in with the TV programme that we just seen, seen and the one that Michael Mosley's done from on Channel 4 recently. Boy, when you read that book, do you understand how 400 years of marketing is embedded in our culture and it's not going to be easy to change this. Um, the shame game, similarly, we have a great, I think that, that helped me to talk to uh, fellow councillors and other groups about, oh, you know, they, they wanted more good food education lessons all the rest of it because there's this fickle underlying poor folk who just, you know, they need to be told what to do. Well, those of us that are in behaviour change know that that doesn't work. Um, I've been linked as a personal mentor with to start doing Breeny Brown stuff, and that is where then I took that conversation to Sustain's meeting in Leeds, and when they were talking about setting up the academy, and I went, yes, please, because I'm like, hey, I hear lots of stuff where we talk about 
dealing with folk at the front line, but those of us having the tough conversation up here, we also need our own little support group. And I currently get mine from Heaven, Helen Bevan, which is that you know innovation and change place within the NHS. So, Sorry, Jackie, just to let you know yeah. your time's coming towards Yes, end. okay. With, so my two, I have five stories that I cart around. They're called, I don't want uh, a food parcel, being Cruella, what a waste, pot noodle, and something else that I can't remember. The two relevant to here, more folk need to be Cruella, which is where you speak out and say you will no longer promote rubbish food. Um, I was challenged by a local council said, but you're denying our poor children a treat. I went, no, we have the worst teeth in the country. And until we start speaking like this, it's a whole load of nonsense. And then uh, my husband's a litter picker and he took a photograph of a discarded a fair share parcel full of ultra processed foods and that started the conversation locally where you say go you think you're giving out food and you're feeding the poor as folk like to label but you're you're not you're just feeding them rubbish and very often they don't even want that rubbish so we've got everybody in the town involved from food waste to yeah the breastfeeding the whole kitten caboodle but at the same time we're nowhere near as far as oxford and hull and what the rest of you are doing done Thanks so much, Jackie. It's really interesting to hear it from the angle of how you sort of start to have those conversations. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, so before we split into our breakout groups, we've got a little bit of time to ask questions to um, all three of our speakers. Um, so the first question that's come through, um, this came through just, just at the end of uh, Rob's talk. So I don't know whether, Rob, if you want to start to talk to this but actually maybe it's to all the speakers um so breakfast cereal is considered and marketed as a good start to the day how do we change that that's from anna um great question yeah so breakfast cereal is is one of those that can either fit into the processed or ultra processed category um and and there are healthier breakfast cereals out there um they're not the ones um with all the cartoon characters on and and, and sugar and, and and highly processed um so I think it's really difficult as a as a parent or as a citizen to know which is which, which are the good ones. Um, so some some support for families to to pick through um, the good from the bad would, would certainly be a good starting point. Um, and then we need a shift across society um, away from highly processed foods towards real food, um, more more fresh and minimally processed food, and and understanding breakfast as an opportunity to to shift that dial. Um, so there are solutions on a, on a national level to do with marketing restrictions and, and uh, um, the promotion of a, a less highly processed diet. But on a local level, um, we'd be really keen to discuss with you in the breakout groups how we how we um, discuss these issues and, and, and share understandings. Thanks, Rob. Um, I don't know if, if anyone else wants to come in on that question before I move on to the next one. Okay, great. Um, so then um, sort of a practical question from Lisa. Could you touch on what snacks would be a healthy alternative for young children, like healthy swaps we could promote? So Victoria, if you'd like to come in on that. Hi, yeah, we've got, um, for those of you who don't know about First Steps Nutrition Trust, um, we've got a range of what we call our eating well resources. They're photographic resources um, that cover um, different age ranges and groups. And we've got one that's totally dedicated to one to four year olds snacks for one to four year olds and I put that in the link um there's, there's also information on NHS um and the start for life web pages um so they're good places to go and it's all about basically unprocessed and minimally processed foods um so yeah fruits vegetables um carbohydrates you know slice of toast um then the question is, is the bread ultra processed? That's, um, and yeah, to some extent, um, protein, so a glass of milk, piece of cheese. Um, so yeah, different examples in there. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And we'll we'll make sure we send some of these key links out when we send the slides and, and recording um, of this webinar out. Thanks for that, Vicky. Um, Naomi, great question. I'm going to subtly breeze over the question about what are the first steps as a food alliance that we should take, because we're going to try and tackle that question a little bit in, in the breakout rooms in just a minute. Um, Emma's put in sort of a, a comment and a question around. Uh, so Emma says a lot of discussion up here about any food is better than not. 
and ditto about treats um sam which is referring to sam saying that um there are complaints when they try to reduce the amount of treats at the food bank so emma's asking how we change that um how we change the mindset because it can be so difficult to um i don't know whether jackie you'd like to come in on that from a your experience uh you need a champion, dare I say, a bit like me, somebody who's that little bit distance, who's prepared to go out and just keep giving those tough messages. And you can only get those confidence if you've done some personal mentoring, like that Breenie Brown stuff. I think it's it. And we do. And that's why I would say we need an academy to build up those skills, to have those tough conversations. But don't hold back from making, you know, having that step and taking it forward. Because, you know, you can say that that tough bit, um, folk at that point go oh no they're horrible but then they go away and think so you do need a consistent message being given out across the whole of your whole of your alliance and some folk who are prepared to say the more difficult messages thanks for that Jackie um, so we've just got a couple of minutes left I wonder whether um, something that struck me in in the soil associations reports around this was um, how sort of cross-cutting an issue UPFs are in terms of their environmental impact and some of the sort of social consequences of the of the the markets around it. So um, I'm, I'm going to use my chair's privilege to ask a question um, about whether there are potentially other ways of of engaging with this for partnerships from the perspective of their really kind of cross-cutting, cross-sectoral work whether there are any other angles they could be taking on UPFs such as the environmental impacts um, as a way to engage uh, local authorities uh, or their local communities. Yeah so. I do I do think I've got an angle on, on that with the litter picking our next step with reducing the volume of our bins is to do workshops in back alleys where we tip the bins out and do a bit I think it was Hugh Fernley Whitten sort of did much the same in Northumberland but it is it's how you, it's only then when you're doing it right where people live rather than inviting folk to something else because folk post-covid actually don't want to go to groups very often either we've got to take our messages and our cross-cutting messages to where people are at so small local groups and start emptying out bins and examining what they're doing as a way of reducing that volume and the whole mm. sustainable bit yeah, I'd, I'd agree with, with with that, and and I think where the um, the sustainable food places network can be really, um, really powerful in all of this, really helpful, is in demonstrating what's possible, building the confidence of of national policymakers to do something about this, because we know that UPFs are a concern not just for health but for the environment, and the solutions do not lie um, just with the individual. It's not it's not up to us just to make better choices. We need to reshape the, the system in which those choices are made. Um, and, and national policymakers can be uh, quite quite slow to catch on to new agendas. They can be they, they can take some persuading. Um, so if we can, um, if, if the Sustainable Food Places Network can take on this issue and in a sense show what's what's possible in local areas, that that can um, really amplify up um, building the confidence of, of national parliamentarians and so on to, to do something about this. So I'm um, looking forward to discussing with you and seeing seeing what all that looks like. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks both. Um, so on, on that note, um, hopefully you're all bubbling with some thoughts and ideas. So we're going to now send you off into breakout rooms uh, for 15 minutes to discuss UPFs um, and UPF snacks, sort of specifically the drivers, the solutions, who we need to influence and what the Soil Association can do to, to help us address our multi processed diets in our communities. So in each group, you'll have a, a Miro board. Um, I'm just sending the link here. If you haven't used it before, you just go to the address, type in the password, and then we can all collaboratively put ideas down in our separate breakout rooms on that website. Um, so uh, you'll also have someone from the Soil Association in your breakout room to help guide the conversation. So that'll either be Rob, who you've already met, um, Kathy, who's the policy advisor for campaigns at Soil Association, um, and, or if we have a third room, uh, you might also meet Laura, who's the policy officer for healthy and sustainable diets at the Soil Association. So um, make sure someone in your group volunteers as um, someone to feedback in our plenary session at 11 so we can come together and share all, all of our ideas. So um, Sophia is going to pop you all into breakout rooms now and we'll see you in 15 minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. Well, if your breakout room is anything like the one I was in, um, there were some really interesting conversations going on, um, both about the the importance of working from the, the bottom up, from the communities up, and also the limits and how it's really important to have changes at a national level as well. So, yeah, some really interesting and um, quite tricky, tricky conversations. Um, so we're just going to take a few moments now for one person from each breakout room to do a quick summary for us, um, if that's all right. So do we have a volunteer from any of the rooms who'd like to start us off? Just a, a two minute summary of some of the main points that came up. Uh, if we start with breakout room one, which is the room I was in, would anyone like to, to share some of the key things that came up? If we're feeling shy, maybe I'll ask ask Kathy to to do a quick summary. If that's all right, she did a brilliant job facilitating, so she should have some of the key key thoughts. That's fine. Thanks, Bella. Thanks. Sorry, I completely forgot to ask um, someone to do that in the in the breakout room. Yeah, it was really it was we were having a conversation while um, while people were posting. So. Um, Thank you, everybody. It was really, it was really useful. So um, yeah, we talked about um, we sort of we didn't really take each aspect in turn. We just kind of went around everything. But um, in terms of the the drivers, um, we know that there's well, first of all, there's a need for awareness. But where there is awareness, it doesn't necessarily result in behaviour change. It's it's difficult. Um, in some circumstances to choose alternatives to ultra processed food. Um, we talked about um, economy, so the cheapness of um, these products. Um, policy that there needs to be more um, government regulation, um, advertising. Yeah, these companies that make the ultra processed food have huge advertising budgets and they are convenient, so easy to pick up and easy to eat. Um, in terms of for solutions, we've got policy, um, so local and national government um, and campaigning um, by organisations like Soy Association and Sustain and others. Um, we need legislation on um, advertising. Um, we need to make healthy food the norm. Um, and maybe even looking at something like ultra processed free towns, if it was possible to get local authority support for that and, um, and maybe through an awards, awards scheme. Um, and then who do we need to influence? We need to influence schools and children's centres. Um, barbers and hairdressers is an interesting one. Um, uh, dentists, food businesses and um, cafes, takeaways, and then maybe looking at um, influencing from community um, up and then, and then influencing national policy rather than the other way around. Um, but then there was also a counter argument that we need national action first because it's really difficult sometimes to do things on the local level. And then what can the Soil Association do to help? We can run campaigns um, that we can share and help us raise awareness, um, resources, um, easy projects that could be undertaken at the local level. Um, and then um, helping um, local groups to understand how we can um, do some of the regulation side of things, um, easy, to, easy to share information and so on. Thanks very much to my group. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was an excellent summary. Um, can I pick on group two now, breakout room two? Do you have a volunteer to give us a quick summary? Hi, it's me. My name's Lisa. Um, I'll just go through the kind of conversations that we had and also the posts that we added to the section. So our first question was, um, what are the drivers? And we mentioned quite a lot um, marketing marketing in different places um, across UK and the differences between different areas. Um, we spoke about the availability of um, the availability or poor good food access. Um, we spoke about how there's perceptions of, of convenience around um, ultra processed foods and um, the perceptions about not wanting to waste money on foods that are possibly seemed healthier, uh, deemed healthier that kids might not eat. Um, the, another perception, quite a lot of parental kind of perceptions was um, needing to keep your children happy and quiet. So again, going back to um, thinking about the foods that children might eat, might not eat, um, ultra processed foods might be deemed more likely um, that the children will accept. Um, we spoke about a poor understanding of what eating well looks like for infants and children. But I know that was mentioned quite a lot in the presentations um, in, in the past session. 
So what are the solutions and what will have the biggest impact on UPS? So mentioned quite a few times in the posts um, was that of stricter, stricter marketing um, and stricter regulation around marketing, sorry, for foods for children um, and dietary based guidelines that explicitly mention UPS and also um, UPS in early years. So going back to kind of um, information for parents and kind of put more information out there that makes it a bit more easy to understand. So again, regulation on marketing um, was a common kind of post in our section. So we spoke about um, constructive conversations. I know that um, we had Jackie in our group. So Jackie put in a lot of information about um, behavior change and kind of not berating people for unhealthy eating, but actually promoting um, positive thoughts around more healthier foods um, and what kind of conversations can impact healthier and behavior change. So who do we need to influence um, and who has the power locally or nationally? So I'm just going to screen again. So posts include um, that of legislators and there was another post suggesting that supermarkets have the power to change in-store layouts and also food companies have the power to um, stop using marketing techniques such as cartoon brand mascots. We also have another post here, but I can't quite see it behind um, the stylus. So I need to go back to that. So, what can soil, the Soil Association do to help SFP members address ultra processed diets in their communities? So, um, one of our posts said practical first steps for food alliances breaking down the campaign to bite size. Um, our second post said facilitating them feeding into the forthcoming consultation on the marketing and labeling of baby foods. So going back um, to the early um, years of nutrition and also support us to talk to local businesses with clear asks and business cases. So um, those were our posts. I think you guys can see them. But we are happy for any, any of our team to jump in, but um, the floor is in the to go through. Lovely stuff. Thank you, Lisa. That was that was brilliant. Um, and finally, have we got anyone from group three who can give us a two or three minute summary of their, their discussion? Hello. Yeah, so uh, very much similar to what the other two groups have said. So in terms of drivers, um, we were talking about, you know, good food, the cost, the time, the knowledge about that. So um, needs to be a lot of sensitivity around there in terms of any messaging. But in terms of messaging, it's the focus on three good meals will reduce your need to snack, therefore reducing your overall costs. Agreed that the language needs to be more carrot, not stick, you know, tell people what is good to eat, not what they shouldn't be eating. Um, and acknowledge that skill change and behaviour change takes time. Um, so any um, community work needs to be long it can't just be a couple of weeks in the summer holiday it needs to be prolonged it needs to be a constant message going throughout and a big one is people need to lead by examples and that's the frontline programs public health places like hospitals so the public sector um, and you know who has the who so i'm just reading the um who do we need to influence and who has the power so public health public sector um you know national um level for the power but we can influence more locally uh, and food partnerships providing guidance on healthy food provision um yeah um what can the soil association do i mean yeah agreed guidelines food policies for the community groups support to food businesses um sensitive messaging is a really big one um and working with organizations that redistribute food um to reduce the amount of ultra processed foods that end up in food banks i sort of counter that as a food bank manager uh, it can be really difficult using um redistributed food um lo loads of issues but um yeah i think it, it's changing changing what is seen as normal and preferred have i missed anything from the rest of the group Lovely. Thank you so much for that, Sam. That was brilliant. Really interesting um, comments there. So thank you. Um, and thank, thank you to all of you. Um, it's been a really, really interesting session. Um, thank you all so much for your contributions. It's really nice actually to see such a full Miro board. You always build these things and wonder, wonder what will happen with them. So it's great to see so many um, really interesting points that have been added on there. Um, 
do of course get in touch with us if you have any further questions uh, the recordings of today will be going up online and we'll be emailing that round with the speaker's slides and um, a sort of screen grab uh, or, or link to the Miro as well so that you can carry on uh, reflecting on that if you'd like to. Um, so yeah, nothing left to say apart from thank you so much to our brilliant speakers and facilitators um, and to Sophia for the tech assistance and to all of you for all your helpful contributions. I'm sure it's been really helpful for the Soil Association and um, yeah, I hope these conversations can carry on. So I second that. Thank you, everyone. It's been great. Brilliant. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much. much. And to you, Bella. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Sophia. Bye. Bye. See you all soon. Bye. Thanks.